Okay, so this is the calculus based class. The way this works is we will be meeting three times a week with the other class. It's a little unfortunate because it's just natural to bring up calculus as we talk about concepts in physics. But because I'm the only physics teacher here, we don't have enough time to run two separate classes. And so the calculus topics, as we come by them in that class, we'll just talk about how we do them algebraically. And then when we get together on Tuesdays, we'll talk about how the calculus relates. Now today, obviously we haven't done any math at all. And so today is going to be a math quote review. I put that review in quotes because certainly most of you won't have seen all of the math we're gonna look at today. What we're gonna look at is the scope of the math that we're gonna use throughout the entire school year. So not just this semester, but this semester, next semester. The hardest math comes at the beginning of second semester. When we're talking about electricity and magnetism, we get to the point where students without calculus can only do this amount, students with calculus can do that amount. But it's harder. Um, as we start out this semester, when we start about things like motion, it makes more sense if you understand the calculus. It, it, you see, oh yeah, this equation makes perfect sense. I see where it comes from and why it works the way it does. And so I tend to think that it's easier, if you know calculus, to learn physics with calculus, because you have those things that, are, that make sense. Whereas if you do it with algebra, you do some hand waving and say, yeah, and so this gets us to this equation. So we'll see a little of that right here as we start. Um, there will be occasionally additional assignments for this class that the other class doesn't have. And the regular assignments that you have, you will occasionally have a different problem or two from the problems that people in Physics 151 have. You'll have some questions I put in that have calculus topics that, of course, I can't give them. So any questions about the difference in the two? Make sure we're clear on what today is. That's different. OK. Um, yes, question. Will there be like a concept coach and stuff for that for this? Um, no, because we're using the same textbook. I think next year they're actually going to have a different version that has calculus in it, which would be better because your textbook just doesn't have calculus in it. So no. Also, even if I do use clicker questions, the clicker questions here won't count toward your grade. So, um, you know, I always want people to answer if I put up a clicker question, but because of how, you, how I calculate the grades, it would mess everything up if, you know, I gave them here and then all those people just got zeros for their participation in your class. Any other questions? Yeah. Will our homework be on expertise? Um, the assignment that I'm giving to, oh my goodness, I forgot to print it out. Excellent. I meant to print out everything that I'm going to have here. Um, if you go to Moodle and click on the lecture, oh no, I didn't link. Okay, you don't have access to it right now. Um, <laughs> I'll bring them to lab so you can have access to them when we get to lab. Well, I see that in their work they've nicely <laughs> moved the projector for us. I don't think I'm calling it to actually do that without jumping. So there, fixed it. <laughs> oh. That points out another thing. My picture's not uh, centered anymore. That's what I get for messing around with things. Okay. Yeah, better. <laughs> okay. So, so let's get on to talking about math. So the math we're doing, we'll start off with very basic equations. These are equations that come up in the first couple chapters of the textbook. And I'm guessing that everyone's reasonably confident looking at equations like the first one. Now, when I have a V... That V means speed. Of course, the question any logical person says is how do you get speed out of V? Or how does speed give you V? And the answer comes with what I mentioned at the very end of class yesterday, velocity versus speed. Velocity is speed with direction. And that V actually stands for velocity. So <laughs> if the V stands for velocity, why do I call it speed? When you're writing things down to indicate that something has direction, you put an arrow over it. So that is the symbol for velocity, whereas that 
is the symbol for speed. The difference is the arrow. Now, of course, because it's V, this is why I make the mistake so often. I look at the V and I just say the velocity. But it actually is the velocity if it doesn't have the arrow over it. Okay, so we have speed is dx dt. Everybody understand dx dt? I don't think anyone's ever said dx over dt. I don't think. And while it's true that these are technically not fractions, we will learn that we treat them like fractions when we do our math. Now, I know at least a few years back, Calculus One ended the semester with a section on treating simple differential equations like this one. And so we're gonna learn how to do a little bit of differential equations right here today that's really simple, doesn't require any more knowledge on your part. It's just basically doing some algebra. So the speed is the derivative of position with time. That is Einstein, or Einstein. <laughs> Let's make up a whole new history. Newton. When Newton developed calculus, you guys know the history of Newton? A little bit. It, it's, you know, probably know it better than me since she's like asking, what was his birthday? I don't know, Christmas. Um, so Isaac Newton was born and his father, I think, died like, you know, as an infant. So his mother got remarried when he was about two. And the man she remarried said, you know, I'm, I'm married to you, sweetheart. I didn't marry that kid. He can't come live with me. And so he actually was raised by his grandmother. And as a kid, he's going to school. And the guy was wicked smart. I mean, as we could all agree in hindsight. And so he's in school. And what do you suppose he did in school as the super smart kid? Make his own problems. <laughs> well, he didn't make his own problems. He didn't do what the teachers wanted to do. He did what interested him. So he made little inventions to impress the young ladies and things like that. And so he didn't get good grades because he wasn't into doing what the teacher wanted him to do. And so when he finished like the, the compulsory education or something like sixth grade, he said, okay, this guy's not cut out for school. He's got to get a job. So he gets a job as a shepherd. And as a shepherd, you only really have one responsibility. You know, watch those sheep. Well, no, he sat down and made little inventions. And so he was a horrible shepherd. And people said, okay, this guy's really brilliant. We've got to find a way to you know, get him into education. So he got some funding and was sent off to higher education, where he continued to pretty much blow off what the teachers wanted him to do and learn what he wanted to learn. Until he got to, like, his last year, he realized... Oh, crap. If I don't get my act together, I'm going to have to get a job again, and that stunk. And so his last year, he actually got it all together, worked hard, did what the teachers wanted. He got hired as a, a um, what do they call it, a house professor or something. And basically, it's what we would call a, a graduate student or you know, teaching assistant for graduate school when he finished school. And he started doing things, setting up the lab and teaching some classes. And then he got his big break, the best thing that ever happened in Newton's life, the Black Plague. Because <laughs> what happens when the plague comes around besides bring out your dead? Well, you've got all of your smart young people in school together. And if you have a contagious disease, they don't understand how it's contagious, but anyway, it's contagious. You don't want to keep all your smart young people together so they can all die together. And so they canceled school for almost two years. And so then he went back to his grandmother's house and he had nothing to do. Now, I know you guys don't know me, but up until I got married about five years ago, I just spent my summers with nothing to do where I wanted to be, at my sister's house in Huntington Beach. <laughs> and if I had been new, that's what I would have been. I would have been Huntington Beach, hanging out, you know, go eat at Ruby's on the pier, whatever. <laughs> But Newton was a nerd. Newton was like, sweet, I can just study physics nonstop. I don't have to do anything else. I don't have to worry about these students. I love my students. But, you know, I got time to do what I want. It would be nice to have time to sleep. About eight hours in the last few days because school. Um, so what did Newton do? Well, he sat down and he started trying to understand nature. And he came up with three very important laws, what we'll learn, Newton's three laws. And those... Laws 
made him wonder about other things. And so he looked up at the, well, you've heard the apple story, right? Now that, that story is probably not a true story. It's probably an example. You know, what makes the apple fall? But he realized that an apple falling from a tree has a force pushing it downward as it falls. Up to that point, they'd always thought that forces required contact. That is, I can't put a force on Brady, a force is anything that pushes or pulls, unless I touch him. So I can go ah, all I want. I'm not going to put a force on him. But if I can't put my finger on him, then I can put a force on him. So he saw that apple falling has a force on it, even though it's not touching anything. So we must be able to have forces at a distance. And so that gave him this idea of gravity, and then he looked up the moon. Why isn't the moon falling down like the apple? There's nothing holding it. It should have that same gravitational force. And then, by about, you know, the Earth being a circle, well, a sphere, let's be serious. Uh, the moon going around the Earth, and the moon is falling toward the Earth, but the, you know, it'd go in a straight line if there was no Earth here, but the Earth makes it fall, changing direction, just right, ready to go in pretty much a circle. But how does he work all this out mathematically? Well, there was no math at that point to work it out. And so he said, I'm going to have to develop my own math, call it his math of flexions, I think was his name for it, where he dealt with little minute changes. Instead of having measurable changes, infinitesimal, that's of the order of one over infinity size changes. And so he developed this math. And he, he wrote that he had developed a new math. Um, I could never remember, remember his name, but a... French mathematician came over to learn from him, and so he told him about his new math. He went home and he published about his calculus. And he published, Newton didn't publish. And so there is to this day some people who claim that the French guy invented calculus rather than Newton because he was the first one to publish it. And I mean, obviously, I've made clear how I believe it occurred. And he did mention that he had developed it first. Our nomenclature, the signs we use, are the signs from the French guy. You'd think I'd remember his name. Um, because, and his explanations are better than Newton's explanations. But Newton came up with it. So there's a story on how calculus came to be. So we could solve things like what we're doing here. So a typical kind of problem that we're going to be having in the next couple of weeks that involves calculus is a problem that says something like, given a function x, x is a function of t, that x parenthesis t means x is a function of t. Find what v, the speed, as a function of t is, and a, the acceleration, a function of t is. So speed was the derivative of, hey, let me do it this way. Speed, it'll only stay there as long as my hand does, and then I will go a lot. <laughs> speed is the rate at which position changes with time. x is position, t is time. So dx dt is dx, an infinitesimal amount x, divided by dt, an infinitesimal amount of time, is the ratio of those two, how it changes. And acceleration is the ratio of the infinitesimal change in speed divided by the infinitesimal change in, in time. Now, I said speed because that's what's written here. The true equation, of course, is acceleration is equal to dx vector dt because a change in direction also requires an acceleration. Acceleration is change in direction or change in speed. If we're doing things one dimensionally then the equation that's written there is what works. And that's why it has a sub x because it's one dimensional only in the x direction is dv sub x the speed in the x direction dt. If you substitute the upper equation into the lower equation oh don't obliterate. That's bad. Um, there. If you substitute the Vx in, the acceleration can also be thought of as the second derivative of x with respect to time. Um, you may have always wondered, wondered why you have a d squared on top but a dt squared on bottom. And it's actually, you can do things like d second x, d y, d z if you want. And so the dt squared means we're doing the derivative with respect to time both times. On the top, it's just the second derivative of this function. So that's why the nomenclatures are actually different.
I know. You may not have known that, but you may not have cared either. So typical problems, given a function for X, find V and T, or V and A. Or given a function for V, find X and A. Given a function for A, find V and X. So let's just look at the process. I have words here to describe it, but let's look at the process with a practical problem. So here I have a problem. Given X of T is equal to 9 times E raised to 3T minus 1, what are the speed and accelerations as a function of time? So let's start with speed. What was the equation to find speed on the previous slide? dx dt. So I'm just going to do v is equal to dx dt and then substitute. Now, of course, nobody writes it out that way, right? I mean, you just say, okay, I've got x, I'm going to do the work. But for the beginning, I want to be explicit. I want to be clear what I'm doing. And so now I take that derivative, hmm, 9e to the 3t. I can expand that in my head. Are you guys impressed or what? <laughs> What's derivative of 9e to the 3t with respect to time? Okay, people are on top of this. You have, that's going to be 9 times the derivative of the exponent is 3 and then e to the same exponent. So that's the derivative of the first term. And then I have the second term, which is minus nine. What's the derivative of minus nine? Zero. Well, minus zero technically, but plus and minus zero, nobody cares about the difference. So as people were saying, that's 27 e to the three t. So we found the speed is a function of time. Now that we found the speed is a function of time, how should I go about finding the acceleration as a function of time? Do the next derivative. I swear I changed. <laughs> Apparently all I did was change the position of things here. So I'm going to have 27 times 3e to the 3t is equal to was that hard if you know your simple calculus rules that was simple of course you can get harder and harder functions that will make it hard now the second problem I have here if you look at this one this one is not so obvious I have acceleration is a function of speed. Vm is a constant, stands for Vmax. This is a reasonable facsimile of what the acceleration is for, you know, for certain vehicles. You know, I'd say you have a, a sailboat. Your acceleration is probably proportional to the difference between at rest and your maximum speed. Right, so the closer you get to maximum speed, the smaller your acceleration is. So that's a fairly reasonable function, but it's not a function of time. And the two definitions we had for speed and acceleration were derivatives involving time. So the question comes, how do I solve a problem like this to find acceleration, speed, and position as a function of time? Does anybody know the answer? What did you say? No, behind you. Didn't? No? Oh, was it you? Said so? Okay, substitution. We actually have the first step isn't substitution. It is separation of variables. I ha I'm going to first write acceleration is equal to dv dt. That was our given equation. And that's equal to A times Vm minus V. Now, separation of variables means that I am going to – 
first write it down so we have that recorded. Separation, separation of variables means I'm going to have one of my D's in the numerator position on the left side, one of my D's in the numerator position on the opposite side, and the variable for each of those functions only appears on one side of the equal sign. Now, saying it that way doesn't really give you the feel. So if we look at the problem, it's clear. I have dv and dt. So my two variables are v and t. I need them both on top. So what would you say? I'm going to start by multiplying both sides by dt. So I'm going to have dv is equal to a v sub m minus v dt. So now I have both of the d's in numerator positions. That's the first step, but I need to have only V's on the left side and only T's on the right side in terms of variables. Constants don't matter, just variables. So right now, I have a V on both sides of the equal sign. So how do I get the V on the, same, on the left side? Divide. So I'll just go ahead and divide both sides by VM minus V. Why didn't I just divide by V? Then, then I would have had VM over V for the first term here. I wouldn't have gotten rid of it. I just would have shifted where it appears. But now I have something that fits into my form. I've separated the variable successfully. Left side, only a function of speed. Right side, only a function of time. When I do this, since the two sides are independent and equal, then if I integrate both sides, they still are going to have to be equal. And so now I'm going to go ahead and integrate up. I obviously, we have a dt, you're unlikely to be taking a derivative further. I'm going to integrate both sides up to try to find my function. So there's our sign for the integral. In physics, when we do our integrals, we almost exclusively do exact integrals. In your calculus class, they teach you about exact integrals, but you almost exclusively do um, ones without limits. So with the exact, I need to have limits on here. So I need to have my starting speed. Well, I told you in the problem in that little statement, let V at time initial equals zero be zero. So I'm going to have my starting time. Time is time initial equals zero. And my starting speed, speed initial equals zero. And then I'm going to go to my final speed. So I'm going to put V sub F and my final time t sub f. And you might say, why are you putting the f's on there? The reason I'm putting the f's on there is so I'm mathematically pure. You can't have your limit and the variable of integration the same thing. And so I put t sub f and v sub f, so v sub f is, is distinguishable from v. After we're all done, I'm going to relax it away and drop the f's. But to be mathematically pure, pure I'm writing the equation like this. So now we do the integrals, and Gila already told us what we need to do now. We need to do a substitution. Hmm? Because the left side, well, you might know how to do that offhand, but it's a lot easier just using a U substitution. So I'm going to go through doing the U substitution just to make sure we remember things. So let U be Vm minus V. So du is equal to minus dv. Since vm was a constant, the derivative of the vm was 0. It's just minus dv. So then I can substitute this u in. vm minus v is u. And on the top, dv is going to be, see that minus sign? So it's going to be minus du on top. Now, that's an easier integral to do, right? Because you just have integral of du over u. You should know, this is one that you 
probably had to memorize in calculus what the integral is. So what's the integral of du over u? Okay, somebody put the negative in there. The negative is because of this right here. Oh, excellent job. <laughs> Even, f what was that? Can you put the negative outside of the integral? Um, yes, I could. What I'm trying to do is figure out how to undo, and for some reason I have something on top of the undo button, so I can't get to the undo button. Um, I'll just try to. Okay, so there I put it out front. That makes it easier. And so if we're going to have on the left side minus natural log of u, and then I have my limits going from u initial is equal to, hmm, since u is vm minus v and v initial was zero, that's going to be vm for the lower limit, right, vm minus zero. And the upper limit will be vm minus v final. So I got those two limits by using that definition for u. So that's my left-hand side. Right-hand side, <laughs> what's the integral of a dt? It's a t. But I can't forget my limits. T final equals T final. Let's just put T final there. Got to get. I used to be able to erase my finger with what I used before. Now I need to add another page because when I worked this out in my office, I wrote a lot smaller. So page manipulation, insert a blank page, boom. Okay, so I got a blank page. I can continue on. So rewriting what we have right now. Ne negative natural log of u going from v, well, u initial equals v max to u final equals v max minus v final equals a t going from t initial equals zero to t final. Now, I've been very explicit about my limits because a lot of people just have forgotten or haven't used these regularly. Now I plug in my limits. When you plug in your limits, you always put the upper limit first. So I just put minus natural log of the upper limit. So U M minus V final minus the lower limit. So minus natural log of that's supposed to be a V it's supposed to be a V not U. Anytime I make a mistake, Correct me because I get really embarrassed if we get to the end and I have a mistake, and especially if like we go home and then I realize, oh, I totally screwed up. So there's the left side putting in the limits. The right side. Now the right side is fine as it is. The left side is actually mathematic, mathematically nonsense. It's mathematically nonsense because you can't take the natural log of something that has units. And speed has units. Speed has units of distance divided by time. And there, you can't take the natural log of that. It needs to be a unitless argument. But you probably all know, how do I take care of that? If I have natural log of A minus natural log of b how can i simplify that you put them together the one that's negative is on bottom the one that's on top is positive so i am going to keep the minus sign out front make this natural log of vm minus v final divided by vm that makes sense mathematically that we can do because the units now canceled out. And I'm going to drop, of course, the superfluous <laughs> zero. And now we're almost done. I have a natural log, a minus a natural log. First thing I'm going to do is just move the minus sign across. 
So I'm going to make this change over to the other side. If I want to solve for V final, how do I get rid of that natural log? I use the inverse function of natural log, which is the E, I think people call it the Euler number. So in a very true sense, what I'm doing is E raised to this power is equal to E raised to this power. But E raised to the natural log, those are inverse functions, and it just gives you the argument of the natural log. So the left side becomes Vm minus V final over Vm equals e to the minus a t final. And now since I'm trying to find the speed as a function of time, that's one of the three objectives, I just need to solve that for v final. So to solve that for v final, I just multiply both sides by vm. to get and then I rearrange by moving this over here and that over there so in the end my equation becomes v final is equal to So there's the speed as a function of time. Now, notice I still have the Fs. Well, those Fs really aren't doing me any good, so I'm just going to erase them. And so there's my speed as a function of time. Now that I have the speed as a function of time, I want to find the acceleration as a function of time and the position as a function of time. Which would you like to do first? Position. Okay, position. So... To relate position and speed, we look back at our initial equations. I'll rewrite the initial equations just in case people don't have them. Those initial equations were V is equal to dx dt and A is equal to dv dt. If I'm trying to find position x, clearly the upper one is the one that has the position variable in it. So I'm going to use that and say dx dt is equal to Vm minus Vm e to the minus At. Now a question that I expect correct answers on. What do I do at this point? Yep. They both just, one said the, the name, one said the process. We separate the variables again. So we multiply both sides by dt. And then we can integrate. So I will have whichever way you like. Obviously, it's the same equation. Now, if we look at it, it's completely separate. The left, the left side only has x as a variable. The right side only has t as a variable. And so now I have to integrate this. Just as before, when we integrate, we have to choose our limits. Hmm. I'm going to say, I didn't have the specified problem, but I'm going to say arbitrarily, I'm going to start at position 0 at time equals 0. Right, you can define where you start unless it's given to you. So I'm just going to set that equal to zero. Why? It makes life easier. To x final from speed initial, which was zero, to speed final. And now I integrate the side. So the left side, well, <laughs> integral of dx, it does not get easier than that if you know how to do an integral. That's just going to be x going from 0 to x final. The right side. I'm going to use the right one because it factors out the vm, the constant vm. So I have vm times the integral of 1. <laughs> That's going to be 
t and then the integral of minus e to the minus a t. How do you do that integral? Okay. I believe you said it right. I'm going to explain, make sure everyone. <laughs> we start with just the e to the minus a t, and then we divide by the derivative of the exponent. So the derivative of the exponent was minus a. And then I have to remember to put my limits in so that I get from my final answer here, x is equal to vm times, and then, why do I have a t? Oh, it's the, the limits I screwed up. See, you've got to correct me when I make mistakes. I hate it when I make mistakes. It's always embarrassing, especially because these are going on YouTube. Like I said in class, you can say, hey, now you can see where my teacher, you know, said v was t. He didn't even notice until the end of the problem when the units were all wrong. So <laughs> I didn't even notice that the colors were different. So I put t final minus zero. That's putting in the limits for the first one, for the t. And then putting in the limits for the second one. Actually, minus and minus makes it a plus now, doesn't it? e to the minus a t f minus e to the minus a zero. What is e to the minus zero? One. A lot of people forget when they're putting in limits, e to the zero is not zero. It's one. And so I have my final answer for, oh, wow, I am just using up a lot of space. For my final answer here, I have VMT plus So there's my answer for the position as a function of time, which is probably a little more complicated than you expected when we start the problem. Now, the last part was to find the acceleration as a function of time. And speaking of time, to make this quick, I'm just going to use this equation, put this V into it. And so just taking the derivative of that the derivative of the constant v sub m is zero. The derivative of the second one, just bring down the derivative of the exponent, which is minus a, and we get a is equal to that. So that's the kind of problem that involves calculus that we're going to be doing in the next week or two. So this second one was obviously far more difficult than the first one, but there was no magical skills here, but there probably is one thing that was new for you to learn, and that was the separation of variables aspect. So any questions about this calculation that's taken up 60% of our class period? Yeah. And remember, you can always look, get the notes on Moodle. Uh, hmm. Yeah. I didn't put the 251 link there either. I will make it available. You can look at the 151 notes from yesterday. Yeah, question. So you would recommend doing acceleration last since you figured out the um, No, that was simply Gabriel's random choice. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, so sometimes there's a, a progression. In this case, it didn't matter which one. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a way that you could possibly show us acceleration without having a uh, speed? Um, well, for this given problem, I couldn't find the acceleration as a function of time until I first find speed as a function of time. Yeah, it, it depends on your problem, what you can and cannot do. Quick question. Yeah. Here's one for the first, okay, second line from the bottom. 
Okay, this line here. Uh, no, the, the green. Okay, green. this line here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. The first CF substitution in. So I had, okay, so this side here, you did it. Yeah. So here I had, this was the first term that I needed to apply my limits to. So I put the upper limit TF minus the lower limit of zero. So oh, this TF minus okay. zero yeah. is yeah. from that. And then this one here in the bracket is from this term. All right, go back two slides. Back to the math we're going to see. <laughs> got to go quick for the rest because we only got 18 minutes to finish. 18? About eight minutes to finish out the period. Um, other things we're going to see. When we get to energy momentum later this semester, we will have equations like the definition for mechanical work that I mentioned in class yesterday. That definition of mechanical work is the integral of a dot product. Remember, the arrow over the top means it's a vector. It has direction. The dot product also has a name, the scalar product. It means you're multiplying the parallel parts of the vectors together. And so when we get there, I will try to make sure I introduce how we do that so you can follow through and do problems. The second one is probably a new concept to you. We have F vector. That's the force vector is equal to minus an upside down triangle with an arrow over at u. That upside down triangle with the arrow over, and I say upside down because the point's down, is called the gradient operator. And the gradient operator is a directional derivative. It's a directional three-dimensional derivative. In Cartesian coordinates, which are the ones that we're most comfortable with, gradient is simple to write. In Cartesian coordinates, plus sign. <laughs> Just more confusion. It's easier to write, but or easy to write, but we've got a couple things. What does X with a little hooray over it mean? No idea? It's what we call a unit vector. Depending on the textbook or source you look at, there are at least three different ways to write unit vectors. Another way is an I with a little curry over it. Another is an E sub, either X or I with a curry over it. But that little curry, the, the hat, that's what we like to say now, right? X hat. The little hat means that it has a magnitude of one. So X hat means a magnitude of one in the direction that I have defined as the x direction. So we call that a unit vector. It just tells us direction. It doesn't tell us number, it just tells us direction. Then the d's have a funny curl to them. Anybody familiar with that? Okay, we got a couple nodding their heads. <coughs> um, okay, since I know Brady in the front, I can't remember in the back what was your name? Cody. Cody, okay, Cody. What, what does that mean to have the, the curved d? <laughs> I know what it means, but not what the name is, right? Them a lot. Um, it's the, the <laughs> yes, it's the partial derivative. I've got to turn off those reminders. I don't like them popping up in class. Although it is good to tell you, hey, time to get your books together. Um, it's a partial derivative. And partial actually in my brain means it's easier. Because if you have a function that has more than one variable and you do a derivative of it, you have to take how each variable varies with the one you're taking with respect to. So if I have a function of x, y, and z, and I take the derivative with respect to time, I'm going to have to do how does x depend on time, how does y depend on time, and how does z depend on time. But partial means I don't care how anything except for the specific variable I'm looking at changes. So a partial derivative means that you know, if I have a function of x, y, and z, and I have a partial with respect to x, then for the purposes of that derivative, y and z will be constants. And so I just worry about the x's, don't worry about y's and z's. So it's easier when you have multiple variables to do the partial. 
because everything that's not an x, if it's ddx, everything that's not an x, you treat as a constant. If it's ddy, anything that's not a y, you treat as a constant. ddz, anything that's not a z, you treat as a constant. So that's what the partial means. It's probably a new idea, well, should be a new idea to 10 of you, since only two raised their hands. But it's a really nice idea mathematically. It makes our lives easier. Now, if you only have one variable, there's no difference in a partial and an, and an exact because you only have one variable. There's no other variables you have to worry about. Okay, coming down to more things we're going to do. Just These are just all the basically all the calculus equations we have. So we have no new math and the things on the rest of this page, just the same type of stuff. When, at the end of first semester, we will get to waves and we'll have a wave equation. So now the first one there, the damp driven harmonic oscillator, that's a differential equation that, des that describes how the position of an oscillator varies with time. You have, you know, M is mass, B is a damping coefficient, um, K is a spring constant, F is a driving force. You're not going to solve that equation, okay? That's a second order linear differential equation. If you take differential equations, yeah, sure, you can do it. But, <laughs> but what we're, we, have, we don't expect that in this class. So what I'm going to do is say your solution has the form of x equals e to the, oh, let's just say ci. It has that form, um, not ci, ct. It has that form, and then you will actually put that in to the equation. You'll take the second derivative with respect to time, the first derivative with respect to time, and solve for things like, well, what does the C have to be to make this a true equation? Or to see if, if it's a solution to the equation at all, if it's possible to have a true equation. So I might give you a function and say, you know, like X is equal to a sine omega t and say does this fit and so you would take the derivatives and put them in that's all you're going to have to do with these types of equations the you know second order linear <laughs> differential equations the second one is a second order <laughs> differential equation with two variables make it, make it more difficult yeah so there's all stuff that we'll get later on that then we'll look into with more depth yes that's right that's right i'm not expecting you to know it all now just an interview or introduction of what's going to have Oh, shoot, we're like totally out of time. Well, the last thing for first semester is an inexact or imperfect differential. <laughs> what the world? As far as you're concerned, just treat it like an ordinary differential. Don't worry if it has the slash through it. It just means it's not really a differential, but you treat it like one. Um, I'm going to skip over the more complicated second semester stuff because I have an assignment for you. And this assignment, next class, next Tuesday class period when we get together, I will have students. Now, there's a total of 10 here, so that means two students won't be able to get the extra credit. I'm, that's an unusual situation. We usually don't have more than 10 in this class. Uh, but for a little bit of extra credit, like five points out of, I forgot what the total is on this assignment, but um, I think it's out of 100, so five out of 100 points you show your solution to one of them. And basically they, they work up in difficulty. The top one's the easiest, the bottom was the hardest. Um, so you'll need to solve these and you'll have to turn them in on Wednesday, not in class. You have time to look at other people's solutions and learn from them before you turn in your final solution. Um, for these, I want you to do the work explicitly. That is like for the first one, I think we all know how to do this. So I'm going to have 5, 2 minus 1, t raised to the 2 minus 1, minus 20, 1, t raised to the 1 minus 1, plus 17. 17 is times t to the 0, so times 0. And then the second line would be, what the actually comes out to the simplification. So I, I want to see you do these. This is the only time I will ever ask you to write it in this annoying explicit form. 
But I want to see that you actually know what the process was. Gabriel? Um, at the beginning of that, why mm -hmm. is it 5 times 2 minus 1? Um, the 5 is this 5. Yeah. The 2 minus 1 is taking this power and subtracting 1 from it. Oh, you're right. That's why you correct my errors. I'm, yeah. Wow. That was full of fail. I ate. But in my defense, I did it right there. Yes. Maybe there's another reason for showing the annoying details because I can make mistakes. Thank you, Gabriel. All right. Now, as you do these, the, um, you know, the, the first half, there are simplification things you can do. Like you can simplify this one. If you simplify it first, it's going to be easier. This one, some people might like to simplify it first. Some might not. It's not that hard either way. Then we have the integrals. The integrals, I once again want to see an explicit detail. So I want to see you write, you know, for the first one, g of t is equal to the integral from 0 to t final. Make sure you put a parenthesis here. Some people forget the parenthesis, and then you have mathematical gibberish. Make sure you have the dt there. There actually are some textbooks where they don't put the dt. But the dt is really important because it tells you what variable you're integrating with respect to, and it actually carries units. And then you would show your next step. So my next step would be 5t <laughs> raised to the 2 plus 1 divided by, watch this, everybody, 2 plus 1. <laughs> Got to be right one day. Um, minus 20t to the 1 plus 1 <laughs> over 1 plus 1 plus 17 t to the 0 plus 1 over 0 plus 1, and then my limits from 0 to t final, and then simplify. I put, well, that's supposed to be a t final. Now, there are two of these that if you're not careful, you won't get full credit on. Good to see my TAs outside the door. Um, one of them, you have a division by 0 error. If any term gives you division by 0 error, you have an undefined answer. The other one, you have an indeterminate answer, but you can determine what it is using L'Hopital's rule. And so that's you know something to look forward to. Okay, I went four minutes over. I apologize. I do try to keep within limits.